Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to apologize on behalf uh, of Professor Raul Caruso, uh, director of CESPIC, who is not present at this meeting due to unexpected uh, overlap in Milan. And therefore, I will chair uh, this roundtable titled Different Aspect of Inequality. Uh, I am Antonella Biscione, researcher in economics at Catholic University, Our Lady of Good Counsel, and I collaborate with uh, CESPIC. CESPIC has already organized uh, seminar events in the past to discuss uh, a complex topic um, as inequality. In fact, last year, CESPIC organized a seminar titled uh, Inequality and Poverty uh, Perspective and Reflection Post COVID. CESPIC promotes events. Uh, whose subject is inequality, since uh, inequality is uh, one of roots of conflict and uh, therefore closely related to the theme of peace. Our speaker today uh, will provide us uh, with different point of view, a subject that students present today will not uh, have the opportunity to learn uh, during their courses. Uh, in particular, uh, Professor uh, uh, Stefan Mussard from University of uh, Nîmes will describe the inequality level in France, analyzed through a, dom a dominance approach. Then, uh, Professor uh, Raffaele Lagravinese from University of Bari, uh, Aldo Moro, will talk about the socioeconomic condition of uh, youth in Europe uh, during the <coughs> pandemic period. And finally, uh, Professor uh, Giuseppe Coco from, Un from University of Florence, uh, uh, will explain the role of cohesion policy uh, to reduce and or mitigate uh, inequality between and within countries. I won't to take up any more of your time, so pass the floor to Professor Stefan Mossard for uh, his presentation. Antonella, buonasera. Uh, good afternoon, uh, magnifico. Um, okay. Well, just a few words, be, yes. just a few words to, to thank uh, the organizer, uh, Professor Raul Caruso, who unfortunately cannot be here, to thank Antonella Biscione, who, will, uh, uh, who is uh, in uh, substitution of Professor Caruso, and uh, a special thanks also to the speakers who will give us, uh, I, I think, I'm sure, uh, new ideas about the possibilities of fighting against inequality. I, I think that uh, the topic is uh, very, very important, not only from uh, an ethic point of view, but uh, also in the, especially in this moment, uh, uh, from a social point of view. So, equality. Equality in, in our real world is uh, an utopotic dream. Inequality is the rule an awful rule and uh, we have the the duty of fighting against inequality at least we have uh, to give everybody the same possibilities to build up his his future to realize their dreams so uh, I'm really uh, convinced that uh, this type of uh, roundtables or events or uh, uh, seminars and everything uh, uh, based on the dissemination of culture is uh, important to contribute to outline or to uh, to outline the the possible mechanisms which can be uh, utilized to reduce inequality to decrease 
inequality. So it is my pleasure to open this afternoon and these round tables and uh, thanking very much Professor Musar, Professor Coco and Professor Lagravinese for their contribution. Thank you very much and uh, I really give the, the floor to the speakers. Antonella, thank you very much for your uh, for your contribution. Thanks, Rector, for your remarks. Uh, and uh, I pass the floor to Professor Stefan Musart. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you for your uh, for inviting me to uh, this roundtable. Uh, and uh, as said by Professor Giardani, Giardina, uh, this uh, this theme is very important because we have uh, uh, in France uh, especially some uh, social crisis uh, so uh, I think that uh, the different aspect of inequality uh, must be studied and um, so I'm going to talk about uh, I'm going to share my presentation first um... Did you see it? Yes, we see. At least I see. Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So I'm going to 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 talk about um, income inequality or inequality in France with a dominance approach, and I'm going to um, introduce this um, this presentation with uh, uh, the social crisis we had in France in uh, 2018. Um, this social movement comes from um, the middle class, uh, retired persons, uh, poor workers and poor people. Um, they claim that uh, they support a large part of the taxes and in France uh, the carbon tax is uh, is quite important. Um, some of them are poor workers. Uh, in France the poverty line is about uh, 1100 uh, euros and, and the poor workers are just above uh, this poverty line and um, if we analyze um, uh, their, their claim um, we see that it is a relative point of view. They feel deprived compared to uh, the upper social classes. Um, the price of gas has been multiplied by three since uh, the 19s, uh, since the 90s in France. And in the same time, uh, the wealth tax was abolished in uh, 2018 uh, for households with capital greater than uh, 800,000 euros. So before this, uh, we had a fiscal gain of uh, around uh, 4.2 billions. Now with the, the new tax on real estate fortune, uh, we have a lower fiscal gain around 1.2, uh, 1.3 billion. So the, 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 the gilet jaune, uh, this uh, movement is called Gilets Jaunes in France, eh? so the translation would be uh, Yellow Jacket, if you want. Um, uh, they, they feel a social injustice uh, because they, they think that the fiscal policies are not fair because the tax is relatively lower for the rich and higher for the poor, and uh, especially for poor workers. So many questions uh, arise, how to measure inequality and in the same time being sure that the situation is no more unequal for poor workers or poor people or for all people of the population in general. Uh, how to measure inequality and to impose uh, some uh, priority or more uh, redistribution towards poor people. And finally, how to include uh, indirect taxation mechanisms to reduce inequality. 
So to begin with, uh, the measure of inequality, a standard approach in the literature is the use of the Gini index. Uh, it is a normalized uh, index. Uh, it measures uh, the expected income difference between two individuals drawn at random in a sample or in a population. It lies between zero and one. When it tends to zero, there is a perfect equality in the distribution of income, for example. If it tends to one, there is a perfect uh, inequality in the society when, uh, where one person gets uh, um, all, all, the, all the income, if you want, and the other one uh, gets nothing. Uh, some estimation on uh, disposal disposable incomes in 2019. Uh, in Slovak Republic, we have a Gini of 0 0.22. In France and Albania, we have a Gini index around 0 0.3. And in South Africa, we have 0 0.62. If we look at the distribution of the, the Gini indices in the, uh, the OECD countries, we see that in France, um, we, we are uh, below the mean of the Gini indices, which is around 0 0.32. So you, you have uh, on the right uh, South Africa, on the left you have uh, Slovak Republic, uh, the USA is around uh, 0 0.4 which is quite important, and uh, more importantly, 0 0.5 for uh, Costa Rica. So we see that uh, for France, finally, the Gini index is not very high, but uh, in the same time, uh, there is a social crisis because um, um, the, so the poor workers feel deprived compared to uh, the, the other classes in, uh, in, um, in the countries, in the country, in France. Um, instead of um, measuring inequality with the Gini index, it is um, possible to measure inequality with concentration curves. Um, it plots the share of any commodity consumption, uh, the cumulative percentage, for each income percent percentile of the population, from the poorest to the richest. Uh, with these concentration curves, we can make some uh, dominance uh, exercises. Uh, if, the, if the concentration curves do not cross, uh, we can say for sure that there is more inequality in a population compared to another one. So, for example, in the, in the graph on the left, uh, you see that uh, there is uh, a dominance between uh, two population, two curves, two concentration curves uh, related to, to population. There is more inequality in population B, the red curve, compared to the population A. We see that the curve of population A is uh, closest to uh, the black line, uh, which represents a perfect equality in the society. Uh, the, this would represent uh, a situation where each person in a society gets exactly the same part of the cake. On the right, you see that uh, the two concentration curves cross. And in this case, it is not possible to say uh, with uh, non-ambiguity to say that there is more inequality in population B compared to population A. So um, with the concentration curves and the dominance approach, uh, we can say that for all people of the society that there is more or less inequality without, without um, ambiguity. So what do we learn about this literature uh, on concentration curves in, um, in 2000? Um, there was a concentration curve for a different order of dominance. This means that we can uh, measure inequality by thinking that uh, it's possible to make transfers to uh, poor people. So for example, if we take a concentration curve of order two, this means that um, this represents the behavior of a decision maker who is inclined to perform income transfer from rich to poor. If we take a concentration curve of order three, this means that we can measure inequality with a decision maker who is more inclined to perform income transfers. And those transfers uh, would occur in the left part of the distribution. This means that we can focus on 
uh, poorer individuals. And if we uh, move to infinity, uh, we make uh, finally income transfers only to the poorest person in the population. Uh, this means that we have um, that John Rawls, uh, the philosopher, uh, said we, we uh, put all the resources to the poorest uh, individual only. What do we learn uh, in 2020? We can make some uh, comparisons of population in terms of concentration curves, but with a fractional uh, stochastic dominance order. This means that we can make exactly the same thing we, we said previously with order two, order three, etc., but uh, with the addition of taking uh, a, a little part, a fraction of uh, welfare in the population. I give you an example. Uh, if I take the fractional dominance uh, S equal to plus a fraction F equal 0 0.5, this means that the decision maker is inclined to perform uh, rich two point income transfers. Okay. And the fraction 0 0.5 means that uh, the social welfare variation of the donor is at least higher than 50% of the social welfare variation of the recipient. This means that we can control for uh, what we lose and what we gain uh, from a transfer between the donor and the recipient. And I think this is in line with um, the relative point of view of uh, the, the, the Gilets jaunes in France. Uh, they feel deprived compared to uh, uh, the potential donors in the, in the society. And with this uh, concept of fractional dominance, it's possible to perform uh, indirect taxation. I give you some example on the French survey of budget families in uh, the survey of uh, 2019 on uh, 42,000 uh, uh, individuals. Um, at the order S equal to, this means that we have a decision maker that is inclined to perform uh, uh, income transfers. We see that uh, the concentration curve of gas is uh, below that of leisure. This means that there, there is more inequality in uh, the gas consumption compared to uh, leisure. But we cannot say for sure that there is uh, uh, more inequality in gas because there is a crossing between the curves. So we can look for the minimal degree of uh, dominance and we find that uh, for a degree of 3.2, there is a perfect dominance between the curves and we can assess that there is more inequality in gas compared to uh, leisure. Another example, uh, if uh, we draw the concentration curves of clothes and food, we see that um, there is a crossing between the curves at the order three, but at the order 3.99, uh, there is no crossing and we can say that there is more inequality in uh, consumption of clothes compared to uh, consumption of food. Okay, so uh, the question would be now to uh, find the minimal degree of fractional dominance for many pairs of commodities in order to uh, give maybe some uh, direction of uh, fiscal policies in France and maybe to reduce inequality. So I show you some results. For example, we can take uh, the second line, the line uh, gas. Uh, the second line, for example, with clothes, means that uh, the concentration curve of gas uh, is above uh, that of transport. So this means that there is less inequality in gas compared to uh, transport. Okay. We see that uh, the concentration curve of gas is also higher than that of clothes. So if we look at the degree of uh, dominance, we see that for clothes, we have a degree of dominance, which is 5.74. This means that uh, the decision maker uh, in this case is really inclined to perform transfer to the poor 
of uh, the society. But in France, it is not the case. So we can we cannot say that uh, with uh, our government that this uh, um, view of inequality is possible. With transport, we have a degree of dominance of 2.78. So maybe it's more in line with uh, the view of the government. Why? Because um, when the social crisis in uh, 2018 uh, began in France, uh, we had to wait for um, one year to, uh, for the government to make transfers to poor workers. They finally give uh, them uh, 100 euros um, uh, of wage um, uh, more um, for, for them. So this means that they are inclined to do uh, some transfers, but um, the intensity of transfer is not very important. So we can say that we are around a, a degree of dominance, uh, maybe between two and three. Um, between gas and leisure, we see that the degree of dominance is close to two. But in this case, if we look at um, the optimal taxation theory, uh, which is a model uh, used by the World Bank. Um, and uh, we have some uh, well-known results about, uh, about optimal taxation. For example, uh, Jean-Yves Duclos, Paul Magdissi, and uh, Quentin Vaudon made uh, important works uh, into this field. And uh, there are some results about uh, concentration curves. Those results say that when we compare two curves of uh, concentration, uh, we can increase uh, the tax on um, the commodity for which um, the curve is below. This means that there is more consumption which is concentrated to the rich people. So it is um, possible to increase the tax on, um, on this commodity and to decrease the tax on the commodity for which the curve is higher when there is uh, less inequality. But in the case of gaze and leisure, this means that um, because gaze, gaze is uh, dominated by uh, leisure, we should increase the tax on gaze, decrease the tax on leisure in order to get an overall decrease of inequality in the society in France. And it is not possible because uh, the, the Gilets jaunes want to have a decrease of uh, indirect tax and uh, especially on uh, commodities linked to energy, fuel, gas, electricity, for example. A last question about uh, indirect taxation and, and uh, inequality is the cost of uh, the possible uh, tax reforms. For this, uh, with the concentration curves, it's possible to measure the ratio of cost of funds. An example, if the ratio is uh, 1.5, when we uh, intend to uh, make a fiscal uh, policy with two commodities, this means that uh, for each euro of tax benefit, we have to make an expense of 1.5 euro. So this means that it is more costly than uh, the benefit. If we see this table, we see that uh, all ratios are higher to one. This means that all the possible fiscal policies um, by pairs of commodities are, are all uh, inefficient because they are all costly. But this is normal because um, all these policies are possible to reduce inequality. So they are in line with the raw distribution, but we know that we cannot do in the same time redistribution and efficiency. It is not possible. So if we uh, take the possibility to say, okay, we can do redistribution, we see that the two curves uh, do not intersect and this represents the behavior of the decision maker is going to perform income transfers with different degrees. Um, we know that um, any fiscal reforms is costly. If we take the second line of the table about gas, we see that uh, with uh, gas and clothes, it is not very costly. Uh, for each euro of uh, tax benefit, we have to, uh, the expense is 1.17.
Okay, so this means that it, it could be possible to increase the tax on clothes, to decrease the tax on gas, and to have an overall uh, decrease uh, of inequality for all the population, not only for the poor, for all the population in France. But if we look at the table before, we see that we can do that for a decision maker with a degree of redistribution, if you want, very high, 5.74. So it is not possible in France because this doesn't correspond to the behavior of our government of, or our president, I think. About gas and transport, the cost is very low, 1.11. So it's possible to increase the tax on transport and to decrease the tax on gas in order to have a, an overall decrease of inequality. It, it would be possible. Um, and finally, the, 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 the cost, uh, which is uh, the minimal one, is, uh, sorry, about food and gas, 1.08. Uh, this means that uh, in this case, um, the direction of uh, the fiscal policy will be we have to increase the tax on gas and to decrease the tax on food in order to have a decrease of inequality. But increasing the tax on gas in France actually uh, since uh, 2018, um, it has not been possible. To conclude my presentation, uh, so we saw that um, we can make um, a walk in order to analyze transfers between individuals, inequality, taxation. Uh, with the fractional dominance, we have a fine grain dominance criterion for uh, uh, more efficiency, maybe, in the redistribution. And we have to make a cost benefit analysis in order to um, make an evaluation of the decrease of inequality in the population and to identify fiscal policies for uh, social peace. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Stefan, for your presentation. And now I pass the floor to Professor Raffaele Lagravinese, who discuss uh, the health, work and education condition of youth in Europe during the pandemic period. Okay, thank you very much, um, Antonella, for inviting me. And uh, uh, it's a very pleasure for me to be here with uh, with uh, with this panel. So, unfortunately, today I am not a technical presentation, but I want to discuss with you about the generational inequality, and uh, I will use some results that come from. Uh, a recent paper published by the International Lab Organization on the, the effect of the, the pandemic on the on the youth in in Europe. So uh, very quickly, I I, I prepare uh, uh, several slides in which uh, um, I will attempt to follow some uh, of important. Uh, uh, teams. So the first is, uh, I will attempt to answer uh, this question, why is the youth particularly affected by the pandemic? And then uh, I will discuss the, the impact of the pandemic on youth and employment and a new form of inequality, specifically looking at the impact on young people, education and social situation. Um, and then I will conclude with some policy recommendation. <clears throat> well, why is youth particularly affected by the pandemic? Uh, young people have been uh, hurt by the wide reaching level market uh, and social impact of COVID-19. And uh, the younger workers uh, either lost jobs, uh, dropped out of the labor force or experienced a uh, delayed uh, entry into into it young people uh, tend to be more uh, more likely to to work in a specific sector that uh, been most affected by lockdown and social distancing measures uh, such as uh, uh, accommodation uh, uh, restaurant uh, food services in general sex sectors that experiencing net job uh, destruction in the, the period 2020 and 2021 Many young people have lost uh, their jobs because they often work on uh, temporary contracts 
and uh, temporary workers have been among the worst hit by the COVID pandemic. Uh, all this situation have had, uh, of course, uh, some, uh, some effects and uh, more specifically uh, recent uh, reports but also scientific literatures uh, suggest that uh, young people have been experiencing the lowest levels of mental well-being in particular in the social dimension loneliness uh, depression and uh, social social isolation also in the, our uh, university we had experienced some situation very uh, so uh, never met in, in, in the past with, with new students. Uh, in this report, uh, this generation is called lockdown generation, stating that uh, the global employment loss of 8.7% uh, uh, among the young people, uh, 15, 24, was more than twice the job loss among the adults. It is approximately around 3.7%. Uh, so if we uh, see the trend on annual employment of youth age uh, 15-29 uh, during the period 25-2020, uh, the figure shows that the annual employment rate of youth age 15-29 uh, fell by two percentage points compared to the previous one. Uh, it stood at 46.2% uh, uh, compared to uh, the 48.2% in 2019. In the aftermath of the global financial crisis uh, during the period 2027 uh, 2028, uh, uh, the employment deteriorated sadly, reaching its lowest point in uh, 20. Uh, 13 with uh, 44 percent and after 2013 uh, rates had uh, gradually recovered until uh, the outbreak of the of the pandemic uh, it's uh, also interesting to see what happened uh, in the um, in the group uh, by group uh, differentiating the results in terms of females and uh, males Indeed, uh, uh, this graph shows that job losses were higher in age group 15-24 than in age group 25-29. In, in particular, uh, young women, uh, they have affected uh, very hard compared to the, to the male. In almost all other age groups, employment decreased more among men than among, among women. So um, this figure is also interesting because uh, uh, compare the situation in the different countries in Europe uh, and uh, there is a huge heterogeneity in terms of uh, recovery uh, when we uh, analyze the youth employment rate. Indeed, while uh, the Dutch youth employment rate uh, uh, always in the same uh, group of 15 24 is even higher than before the onset of the crisis so we had uh, a full recovery compared to the the last uh, quarter of 2019 uh, the rate decreased in uh, in other countries uh, uh, like greece italy and spain uh, in particular and um, so the differences in youth employment rates between the north and the southern member states uh, has been uh, now uh, very, very large. And uh, specifically for some specific area, specific region, like in Italy, as you know, uh, in the Mezzogiorno area, there are some region like, uh, I don't know, Calabria, Sicily, and, uh, and uh, Campania, in which the employment rate is very, very high compared to the rest of European regions. So now um, I want to talk about uh, the needs uh, problem. Uh, the needs, uh, as you know, are the, the students, the, the people that are not in uh, uh, education, employment and training. And um, it's possible to uh, clusterize uh, the European countries in uh, two, three uh, different groups. 
In the Nordic uh, West and the continental countries, the largest groups are generally in short-term unemployment, uh, while in some southern and Mediterranean countries, the shares of long-term unemployment and discouraged workers are, are higher. And uh, in the Eastern European countries, the majority of needs are women owing to the family responsibilities. And uh, this situation is particularly uh, uh, hard in uh, two countries like Italy and, uh, and Greece. There is a, um, an important correlation among uh, uh, needs and weak industrial ecosystem. Indeed, uh, the needs uh, rates on regional NAS2 level shows particularly high persistence in region with a weak industrial ecosystem. Uh, regional lags in productivity, digital skills, and the promotion of green transition tend to be associated, to be linked with lower resilience to the COVID uh, crisis. And at the same time, low growth, low human capital regions tend to be more vulnerable to the COVID shocks, as well as the region with a strong dependence on tourism, in particular in Mediterranean regions. And there is a strong difference between peripheral areas and the core regions in, in Europe. And there is a strong, a strong, as I said, a correlation among needs and weak industrial ecosystem. And compared to the situation in 2020, the youth unemployment rate increased in majority of the Nazi region, but continued to vary widely across the EU region with the highest youth unemployment, uh, like in Spain, I said Greek, and in Italia, Italian region. So now I want to talk about uh, on the impact of people, education, and the social situation. Because as you know, uh, during the COVID, uh, we had experienced a long time with lockdown. And in this context of education, the major difference of ongoing crisis from the previous ones is that uh, switch to online teaching, which uh, is not absolutely a perfect substitution to the, uh, the, the teaching in presence, uh, which can have effect independent to the current recession. So there are several uh, uh, papers on these. Uh, there is a paper of Bettinger that showed that college students taking courses online instead of in person are more likely to drop out and not to enroll again. Of course, there are no the sufficient literature on the effect of COVID uh, related to school closures on student skills. Uh, but uh, um, due to the lack of control data set, there are serious concerns about uh, long lasting scars caused by the school closures uh, during uh, the lockdown. So there are many papers, uh, uh, specifically, I want to quote the paper of Andrzej and Wozman, published uh, at, in the middle of 2020. They uh, measured that losses in earning time and students' competencies uh, will likely have a lifelong impact. In entire student cohort misses out on the skills usually acquired during one third of school year, a country future GDP may be reduced by 1.5% on average for the remainder of country 2.2% if uh, half a school year is lost. Lost learning may lead to lower student competencies, increased class repetition, and reduced educational attainment. Even in higher education, reduced income and increased unemployment. Um, the World Bank published uh, um, three uh, months ago a report in which uh, um, they underlined the digital divide. Indeed, while school closures have affected the educational trajectories of all young people around the world, COVID has confirmed that the digital divide is both deep and deeply gendered, with immediate consequences of the lives of young men and women who are uh, geographically, economically, and technologically disadvantaged. 
in a region where educational opportunities are uh, different, are dissimilar within uh, between countries, the disruption of your learning and schooling have uh, varied in scope and severity since uh, the beginning of, uh, of uh, pandemic. And the digital in inequities is uh, become a new form of inequalities among uh, the students and among uh, the, young, uh, the, the young population. So results in the, in the same report, uh, the state of global education crisis uh, produced jointly by UNESCO, UNICEF and World Bank suggests that the generation of students now risk losing uh, 70 trillion of lifetime earnings in present value or about uh, uh, the 14 percent of today's global GDP because of COVID related school closures and economic, economic shock. The pandemic and school closures not only jeopardize children's health and safety with domestic violence and child labor increasing, but also impacted student learning substantially. Uh, the same report indicates that in low and middle countries, uh, uh, the share of children living in learning poverty already above uh, 50 percent before the pandemic could reach the 70 percent. So a consequence of the, um, this uh, situation have had an impact on uh, mental well-being. Different studies, uh, there is a, a, a report of WHO and the World Bank and OECD uh, that present some preliminary results uh, that have shown that not only young employment, but also young people's mental health has been disproportionately affected by the crisis. Uh, there are uh, several reasons, of course. Uh, um, in general, evidence from several countries suggests that the share of adolescents with mental health condition more than doubled compared to the pre-crisis level. Uh, the prevalence of symptoms of uh, our uh, anxiety, depression, that are uh, rising dramatically among uh, young people. Of course, there are these are symptoms that are not strictly related to young population, but in the young population, uh, the rate are higher compared to the rest of the population. And uh, according uh, to the same report, uh, uh, the worsening of mental health can be attributed to disruption in access to the mental health services, the wide ranging impact of school closures, and a labor market crisis that uh, is uh, disproportionately affect the young, uh, the young, uh, the young people. Um, to, to cope to face this situation, uh, uh, the OECD suggests that uh, will require a scaling up of existing mental health support in educational system, workplace in the health system that comprehensive policies to support young people in education, uh, or to find uh, a, a, keep, uh, a keep job. Um, certain factors uh, affecting mental health more than others. For many young people, the effects of pandemic on mental health might therefore be temporary, of course, but the European Health Forum, however, first that effects may magnify pre-existing inequalities affecting those from marginalized backgrounds uh, so, um, just to conclude, uh, the building back better for all generation government should consider the pandemic provides harsh lessons about the social vulnerabilities uh, arise from inequality. There is a clear need for financial recommitment to public health capacity, but uh, at the same time is, is, uh, is very important uh, taking the social determinants of poor health and well-being. So it is, uh, uh, is important uh, to invest in young people as support in long deprived regions, uh, principally, but of course uh, in, uh, in the sector of society uh, that are most powerful way to break uh, the chain of inequality transmitted from generation to generation. And um, in the same report uh, are uh, reporting the five uh, um, suggestions. So the 
first one is uh, partnering with national statistical offices and the research institutes to gather disaggregated evidence on impact on the crisis by age group is important to provide information by age group to track inequalities and inform decision making uh, in terms of uh, so it, um, so to identify uh, the differences among sex education and social economic background um, it's important uh, and to anticipate the distributional effect of rulemaking and the location of public resources across the different age course by using impact assessment and creating both strength and institution to monitor the consequences on today's young and future generation. At the same time, it's important to promote age diversity in public consultation, state institutions to reflect needs and concerns of different age course in decision making. And then uh, leveraging uh, young people's current mobilization in mitigating the crisis uh, through a system mechanism, tools, and platform to build resilience in societies against future shock and disaster, and uh, provide targeted policies and services for the most vulnerable young population, including young people not in employment, education, and trading, and in Italy. This is, a, 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 is the main issue for the, for, uh, for the policy maker. Uh, for the young migrants, unless young and young women, adolescents and children face increasing risk for domestic violence. So uh, just to conclude, I think that uh, the, the COVID uh, will have an effect on uh, education and the, in the young population, of course that uh, will be a source of future uh, uh, research question for academians, but uh, I think, as I said at the beginning of my presentation, this will be the, the topic for, uh, for the policy maker. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks, Raffaele, for, for your presentation. And now, uh, to conclude, I pass the floor uh, to Professor uh, Giuseppe Coco, who will outline how cohesion policy can be a valid tool to mitigate uh, inequality levels uh, within and between countries. Good afternoon, and uh, thanks a lot, Antonella, for this invitation. Uh, it is most welcome, and uh, I think it is also a, a very interesting topic, you know, let's say, I mean, it's, it's interesting the idea of discussing together, you know, different dimensions of uh, uh, inequality. <clears throat> My topic today is about territorial inequalities and cohesion policies. <clears throat> uh, I will start, you know, by asking a, a kind of trivial question that is, you know, do we need uh, specific policies for territorial inequalities? Are they really needed, you know? Uh, then I will proceed by looking at cohesion policy in Europe and the latest data that we have, you know, about uh, <clears throat> what, uh, what are the outcomes of cohesion policy? I mean, does it work, you know? I mean, has it reduced the uh, territorial inequalities among regions in Europe or not? And of course, the, the, the answer will be complex. Uh, the third issue is whether cohesion policy has changed something in Italy, whether it has been more effective or not. But I'm not sure that I will get to that point, you know. In fact, I, I will ask Antonella to stop me if I get too, too long, let's say. So, I know. Okay. <laughs> Uh, you know, as academics, we really need somebody that, that, you know, puts a discipline on us. Okay, so first of all, is there a need for a specific uh, policy uh, to uh, countering territorial inequality? It, it is less, uh, you know, the question is less trivial than it, look, than, it, than it looks, you know. I mean, many economists would say that, uh, uh, you know, the people entitled, entitled, you know, to transfer, uh, to tackle inequalities, or better to say, you know, the entities that are entitled, you know, to transfers are individuals, not territories, you know. And I think this point of view is basically correct. Um, 
there is a background noise, you know. I mean, maybe somebody has got, you know, uh, an open... Uh, Raffaele, ah, okay. Okay. So is there, um, uh, uh, as I said, you know, I mean, my opinion is that, you know, there is no such thing as, uh, you know, the right of a territory to be more equal to another territory. There are people living in that territory that have specific rights, you know, as citizens, you know, of a certain uh, political entity, you know, and uh, uh, as individuals, you know, they have these rights, you know. So many people, many economists will say that, you know, uh, the best uh, territorial inequality policy is just, you know, a, a redistributive, general redistributive policies like, you know, uh, minimum inco income or uh, minimum wage, for example, you know, or some basic services that are provided, you know, uh, on, a, on a, an equal basis in every territory. You know? I mean, this is a, a, a very legitimate point of view. Uh, of course, you know, because I study, however, territorial inequalities, I also think that there are there is another dimension that is uh, uh, that needs to be tackled. You know, well. The main reason is political rather than economic. Uh, economic. That is that, you know, uh, territorial inequalities behind a certain level, most probably, you know, they deliver uh, political tensions, you know, in the form of, uh, uh, you know, in the form of uh, uh, breakaway uh, attempts or uh, you know uh, the, the the feeling of being uh, treated you know in a, in an unfair way for people living in a certain territory of course you know so it is more the political risk you know that i see as uh, really uh, a justification for uh, territorial uh, policies you know the other justification has got more to do with uh, uh, development policies, you know. So uh, the, the issue is not one of cohesion, but is uh, one of, you know, delivering, you know, the, the, an appropriate level of growth to, to a certain place, you know, which is not exactly the same as the concept of cohesion policies, you know. Uh, so it does not necessarily has to do with in, with inequality because, for example, you know, um, it may benefit more the relatively rich people in the poor area uh, development policy that, than, uh, you know, the opposite. So, uh, so the, you know, the, the final answer, which is, you know, a tentative answer is not a scientific answer, you know, to the, to the question that I posed at the beginning is that, you know, there is a ground, you know, for a, a specific territorial, territorial uh, inequality policy, but this ground lies mostly in uh, the policies for development rather than uh, uh, policies tackling uh, directly inequality. Uh, let's go to the main part of the presentation instead, you know, uh, where I will show you some data, you know. Uh, this has to do with the cohesion policies at the EU level, you know. Has it worked or not? Okay, to, to tackle this question, I will uh, show you some data from the uh, recent... Uh, <clears throat> Can you see it? Yes, Giuseppe, it's okay. okay. So uh, the, the EU has released the, the eighth report on uh, cohesion policies and uh, territorial inequalities recently in 2022, I think two months ago or something like this, you know. Uh, so this is a sort of, uh, is a report that goes by three, four years, you know, one after the other. You know, so. The report issues this year is particularly interesting in my, in my view, because it shows, you know, some, something that, uh, you know, is a, let's say, a consolidated trend, you know, this is the, the map of uh, regions of Europe uh, showing the growth of GDP per head between 2001 and 2019, you know. As you see, 
there is a clear cut uh, difference uh, between uh, okay i mean the, the, I, I, I assume that you're familiar you know with the the map of the regions that are let's say subsidized by cohesion policy in europe you know they are mostly region in the south of spain in portugal in the south of italy the whole of greece and the whole of romania uh, bulgaria and uh, uh, hungary uh, some of the other uh, east european countries the whole of poland of course and uh, the former communist uh, uh, former soviet uh, republic of uh, latvia and lithuania so all these countries, uh, all these countries and these regions are subsidized by cohesion policies, most heavily subsidized, let's say, you know, I mean, there are all the regions, in theory, all the regions are subsidized, but, you know, the ones that are heavily subsidized are the ones that I told you. Now, this map is telling us, however, you know, a totally different story. There are some countries that are, some, some regions, better to say, that I'm growing, you know, at, at a, uh, healthy uh, rate, you know, which are all the eastern regions, you know, and uh, some of the uh, subsidized regions, you know, the target regional cohesion policy that are not growing at all, or they, they, some of these regions, they, they got even a negative uh, uh, net growth over 19 years, 18 years. So this is a, a quite shocking picture, isn't it? You know, I mean, to have a negative growth over 18 years is something uh, uh, really shocking, you know. So we may say that, you know, a first tentative uh, answer is that, you know, uh, if cohesion policy works, it works only for some regions and so for some countries and not for uh, others. Uh, to analyze, you know, this difference, uh, uh, in this case, the report has, has used a very useful uh, um, concept, that is the concept of the development trap. A region is considered to be, an, uh, I mean, the development trap concept is based on the uh, decomposition of GDP per head. You know, if you take GDP per head, you know, you can decompose it in the productivity multiplied by the employment rate and then multiplied by the ratio of uh, uh, active population of the total population. Okay, anyway, it's productivity multiplied by the employment rate. So what uh, some uh, academics uh, established, let's say, is that, you know, there is a development trap in a certain uh, region if at the same time the uh, employment rate and the productivity rate, uh, increase, you know, are below the average of the entire EU. Okay, and this map is based on this concept. All the areas that are colored, you know, by any color, basically are in a development trap for more than 10 years. So they have a slow productivity growth and at the same time a slow productivity of employment, you know. So the, the, this map, I think, is quite shocking because it shows that, you know, I mean, the development trap is not something that concerns only the south of Italy, the south of Spain or Greece. But also, you know, actually the whole of Italy, most part of France, almost all uh, Spain and Portugal, uh, and also some parts of the Benelux, some, some, you know, some region of Germany as well, you know, I mean, marginally, uh, of course, you know, but the, the shocking uh, thing, in my opinion, is that, you know, in fact, we can consider, although being still rich, richer, of course, you know, than, than uh, uh, other uh, regions and other uh, countries, you know, most of France is in a development uh, trap. So it's growing, it has a productivity that is growing less than uh, the average of uh, Germany for 10 or 15 years or even more. In some cases, the darkest green areas, you know, they grow, they, 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 uh, they are in a development trap, you know, for more than 15 years. Uh, 
this tells a story, you know, that uh, uh, for which, you know, basically there are a lot of Europe, a lot of places in Europe, you know, in old Europe, let's call it, you know, that are actually sliding, you know, back. Uh, most of these places were average, let's say, middle income uh, regions, you know. Uh, they are not. They were. They are not. You know, uh, low income region. Most of the low income region. You know, the regions that have the lowest income in in Europe actually are growing uh, uh, quite fast. You know, they are of course the Eastern European countries. Most of them. Uh, so why is that? Okay. So we got several possible uh, explanation. You know, one is that of course. You know, I mean. Uh, the new countries they grow faster and they have a, a larger uh, uh, a larger productivity growth and this is natural because the, the gdp gap is larger you know so they are experiencing you know a sort of a transition that you know every country in europe has experienced you know at some stage so they're going fast just because you know they are uh, underdeveloped basically their uh, labor is comparatively very cheap, you know, and this is certainly part of the explanation. Another explanation has to do with the size of the transfer of cohesion policies. You know, here you see in this graph, you know, the size of the main uh, European funds, the ERDF, you know, which is the main fund for, of cohesion policy and the cohesion fund, and uh, uh, then the European Social Fund. As you see, you know, as a size, as a, a percentage of the government investment, you know, uh, the European transfer are much, much larger for, you know, East European countries, you know, and also for Portugal. In fact, if you look at the countries that you know, got very, the largest bars, you know, look at Hungary, for example, you know, the bar for Hungary is that, you know, the European transfer between 2007 and 2013 are almost 100% of the government investment in, in Hungary. So that means that basically the transfer are, you know, disproportionate relative, you know, to what happens in the old Europe countries. Although there are transfers to Italy, uh, Deutschland, uh, Germany and uh, France as well, you know, but they are disproportionately lower as a fraction of government investment. So cohesion policy makes a much larger impact. Uh, another explanation that is given also by the... Uh, by, by Five minutes. Yeah, some of the literature has got to do with the, with the quality of government, you know, but it is a very partial explanation if you look at the uh, development trap, you know. This is a map of the quality of government index, you know. The, the, the uh, brown uh, and uh, ivory, let's call them, you know, cream uh, portions have got, you know, are comparatively low quality of government uh, index. And the, the bluish ones uh, are high level of government uh, of quality, government quality index. As you see, for example, France has got for most part, you know, high uh, high quality of government index. Although, as we saw earlier, you know, the it can be considered for the most part, you know, with the exception of the Paris area, uh, a country in a development trap. Uh, finally, the last explanation that I want to put forward was was uh, given in, in a recent book by uh, Floriana Cerniglia, Saraceno, and Rio Watt, which is called The Great Reset. It is a sort of uh, annual uh, uh, outlook on European public investment, you know. And uh, me and Raffaella Gravinese wrote a chapter in this book about cohesion policy and the contribution of cohesion policy to uh, the contribution of cohesion policy to uh, capital investment, so to capital expenditure. 
so in in the past, you know, mm, those discussing uh, the impact of cohesion policy on capital expenditure basically made the assumption that the whole of cohesion policy is capital expenditure. But in fact, this is not the case. And uh, uh, we tried, you know, to disentangle, you know, which expenditure in the cohesion policy bundle are more likely to give a contribution to, to capital investment, basically. And so we distinguish between, you know, three categories of uh, expenditure, one which can be considered at a high content of capital investment, intermediate content, and low capital, low content of capital investment, you know. And, you know, this uh, partitioning, let's say, you know, basically uh, gives some idea of why uh, some countries uh, maybe benefit much more of uh, the uh, cohesion policy than others. You know, if you look at the, the countries of old Europe, uh, the proportion of high capital investment and intermediate capital investment are, intermediate capital investment are systematically lower than uh, for Eastern European countries like Polonia in particular, Poland. Uh, but not for all of them, you know, there is also some heterogeneity within these countries. For example, Romania has got a comparatively low capital investment, low capital expenditure type of cohesion policy. We looked also at, uh, you know, the regions that are the largest re recipient of uh, um, cohesion transfer within Europe between 2007 and 2020. And uh, this is the list, you know, they are basically in four countries, uh, Spain, Italy, uh, Spain, Italy, Greece, and, uh, uh, and Poland. Uh, what we found was that, you know, the regions that are target of cohesion policy in some countries have got, you know, a larger uh, gross fixed capital formation than in other countries, you know, and this confirms the idea that probably cohesion policy is used in quite different way in uh, different countries. And this may explain why some countries, in particular Poland, you know, has been growing, you know, at a different rate than, uh, uh, for example, you know, southern uh, Italy, you know, because the content of capital expenditure in uh, the way that, uh, you know, cohesion policy has been used is considerably lower in, uh, in Italy and partly also in Spain than it was in Poland. I think that I don't have more time to discuss the Italian case, you know, but uh, it is more reasonable to stop at this point. Thank you, Giuseppe. Uh, thanks, Giuseppe, for your um, contribution. And uh, also thank my colleague for the presentation. Are there any questions for my colleague? Rector, would you like to add uh, any final comments or remarks? Your microphone is mute. Yes. Sorry. Well, I wish once again to thank the, the speakers who gave us a different point of view, but uh, everything was really interesting and stimulating. And I think we will stop, but our mind has been open and uh, we can uh, really think about uh, what we learn this afternoon. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, I hope in the very next future to meet you personally and not by a uh, computer, let's say. Thank you, good, good afternoon. Thanks, Rector. If, uh, uh, any question? If there are any questions or comments, uh, thank you for all. Uh, thank you all for participating. We'll see you to the next event uh, organized by Czech Speak. Bye bye.
Bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Ciao. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Ciao. Ciao Francesco. Ciao. Ciao. Ciao Antonella, grazie. Grazie rettore.